So antiderivatives. I haven't taught you how to do them, but you already know how to do them. You're going to find out you know how to do them right now. You're going to use rules you already know about. Oh, that's a really big S. I, J, and K. You don't even need to know what those are. I mean, they're letters, but they're constants. So you already know the rule to integrate this. So this is the integral of thing plus another thing minus another thing. So you use some difference rule for integrals. That's all you have to do. So I can split it up. Integral, and I is constant, so you can even go I cos t dt plus j integral dt minus k integral 2t dt. So this is a rule you learned in Calc 1, way back when we first did integrals. It's the sum rule. So go ahead and integrate these. There's three integrals to do. Neither of them are difficult. Just make sure you keep your i and j and k around. Well, there's one tricky thing. Yes. We're doing three integrals, so we'll actually get three constants. So we'll call it c1, c2, c3. How about that? Oh, my cosine turned into cotangent. This should be a cosine t. Thinking something was a little strange. Uh, so you can do guess and check. So what's the derivative of a sine? Regular cosine. I have trouble remembering antiderivatives, so I just remember derivatives and then basically take a shot and then see if it's right. So it's less to remember. All right, so any questions on this right here? I'm going to, now what didn't show up is like a regular constant, not times ij or a k. That'll seem a little bit weird, but if you think about it, this ijk, this is a vector right here. Would it make sense to have vector and then like plus a number at the end? You can't really add a vector and a number together. So you do get constants, but it's a constant for each coordinate right there, not some constant uh, hanging out by itself. And I'm going to reorder it, so I'm going to put all the variable part first and the constant part second. And I don't really like i, j, k, so let's go into bracket notation. So I'm going to go sine t plus c1, comma, t plus c2, comma, negative t squared. I could do minus c3 but I'm going to cheat a little bit and just say pretend C3 is negative or whatever. Add a constant, subtract a constant, same difference if you don't know the constant. So now I'm going to write it as the variable part plus C1, C2, C3. 
So we're getting the antiderivative plus some constant, in this case, constant vector. So your constant is a vector, actually, now, for whatever dimension you're in. And I didn't teach you anything new. We just use all the regular antiderivative rules. We just know what i, j, and k mean. That's all. So our constant is now a constant vector. So if we have a, so this was an indefinite integral. We had no starting ending uh, bounds, so no t value to begin and end at. And if we have a definite integral, where big R prime is going to be little r. So if you integrate a to b, little rt dt, this is big R of b minus big R of a. So this is exactly how it was before. We just use the letter f and x instead of r and t. So we'll get this antiderivative. This is a definite integral. We've computed the antiderivative. Hopefully, I wrote it down correctly. Cos, where do we start? Cos plus 1 minus 2t. All right, so that's the exact. We did the antiderivative above. So we know how to integrate this. So we can write it as, and it'll be sine t comma t comma negative t squared. And then we do our vertical bar from 0 to pi. So same vertical bar notation. Nothing's really changing except we have a vector now. So we get sine pi comma pi comma negative pi squared minus sine 0 is 0, 0, 0. Well, that was very easy. So sine pi is 0, pi negative pi squared. So there's a definite integral right there. Next example we're going to look at. So there's a piece of electronics called a black box that's basically a really, well, it has a lot of other things in it, but one thing in it is an accelerometer, and it's on airplanes and certain other vehicles, and it records what, it records lots of things, but one of the things is the acceleration that it experiences. And what we're going to do is use that information and figure out. Uh, So we're going to know the acceleration of plane experiences and airplane experiences. And we know when it crashed and what location. And then we're going to figure out, what are we going to figure out? All right, I'll write the problem down so far, and then I'll figure out what we're trying to find. All 
Now, one of the problems in reality with this is accelerometers read every periodically, lots of times per second, but they're also inaccurate, and they don't read every single acceleration force every single moment. So they're an estimate of the acceleration. So that's one of the big problems with using them to make this type of conclusion. It's all gonna be an estimate. So you have to have what's called dampening or smoothing, and so you have to clean up your data before you can actually uh, use it to make uh, somewhat accurate predictions or, or say what had happened. So suppose you know the acceleration that a plane experiences. that an airplane experiences, so we don't confuse it with the plane that we were using before. and the plane crashed at time t equals zero. At location, three, two, five. Very nice GPS coordinates. <laughs> So we'll just find let's find the v of t function. So how is velocity related to acceleration? The derivative. So the derivative of velocity is acceleration, or the antiderivative of acceleration is velocity. So that's how we're going to relate the two. So we want to find the velocity. So if I read it as vt equals, it's going to be the antiderivative at dt. So we're going to get the integral, negative 3 cos t, negative 3 sine t, negative 2 dt. So compute this antiderivative right now.
I just realized we don't need the location, we need the uh, velocity it crashed at. Location would be position. We would know something about the antiderivative of this antiderivative. So we'll just pretend this is velocity. So how do I use velocity, that velocity up there, with this uh, v of t function that I have? So what does this information tell me? The velocity is 3, 2, 5 at time t equals 0. So I know at t is 0, so if I plug in 0, my velocity should be 3, 2, 5. So if I rewrite it, uh, v of 0 equals 3, 2, 5. So now I get to figure out constants from this right here. So we're using, this is initial condition, is what we call this. So we have 3, 2, 5 equals, I'm just going to put 0 where I see t, negative 3 sine 0 plus c1, 3 cos 0 plus c2, 0 plus c3. So I know c3 right away, and we'll just sine 0 is 0, so we just get c1 comma cos 0 is 1, so we get 3 plus c2, c3. So we can tell right away what c1, c2, and c3 are. So c1, c2, and c3 are 3, negative 1, positive 5. You can do some algebra if you want, but I think these are probably easy enough to just say what the numbers are. So 3 is C1, 2 is 3 plus C2, so C2 is negative 1, and then C3 is 5. So I want to write out the full velocity equation, and I'm going to put the numbers in for C1, C2, and C3. These are our initial values, so our final V of t is negative 3 sine t plus 3. Our y is 3 cos t minus 1, and then negative 2 t plus 5. So there's our final, or our velocity equation. So you can't actually sense velocity you can only sense acceleration. So if you're in a car and it's a really nice car with nice shocks, you can't really tell how fast you're going if you have good tires and the road's smooth and all that. I mean, you can hear different speeds based on your tires, the sound they make. You'd probably know the difference between 20 miles an hour and 70 miles an hour, I imagine. But if you couldn't hear and, you had, and you're riding on a really smooth road, you wouldn't know 20 versus 70 unless you were looking out the window, which you probably would be, but you don't feel that. You can see that and sense that with other things, but not by feeling. Same thing if you're in an airplane, you don't necessarily know if you're going 300 or 600 miles per hour. You have some sense that you're moving quickly, but you know, without looking down at the ground, you have no real idea of how fast you're actually going. Yeah, you'll feel acceleration because you will, uh, you're going against gravity, so you'll feel extra heavy when you take off. And then at some point when you start to tip down and land, your stomach feels that you're really light for a little bit. And then at some point, um, you stop having that feeling. Now, if you have a good pilot, you barely, it's the smallest, you barely even perceive it. And if you have uh, a more aggressive pilot, um, you definitely feel it. Same thing with drivers in driving a car. Usually newer drivers. Uh, have higher accelerations.
So we're going to look at ideal projectile motion. So these, most of this calculus was inspired by actually shooting things at people or structures. Uh, so it was really for projectiles that you're thinking about. You know, as for computing, um, maybe where a football is going to land, how hard you have to throw a football or a baseball to, you know, make it to home base. Um, that was not generally how these things were inspired, uh, like catapults and all the other fun stuff. Um, arrows are a bit different because they they have um, the aerodynamic properties that make them uh, fly a little differently. Uh, but things like catapults, cannonballs, all that round, heavy type projectiles. Um, now we say ideal because we are going to compute them without air resistance. So air resistance is hard to think is hard to compute, easy to think about. It generally slows things down. The faster they're going, the more effect it has. So we're not going to get into that too much. Do they do that in physics at all? Yeah, that is a little bit. Is that the, one of the harder parts of? So you got to estimate it because yeah. the math is almost impossible. Yeah. All right, so that's why we do ideal projectile motion. So we pretend like there is no air resistance, and that's that's where the word ideal comes from. It doesn't mean that you know my cannonball is amazing and perfect. It means that there's no air resistance, so that's ideal. And of course, we're going to do these in R two for now, and so we're going to take a side view of what's happening. So it's pretty easy to draw out what happens. Generally, without, uh, with only the force of gravity, you're going to get a uh, sad parabola. And this one's drawn shot from zero, height zero, uh, across a completely flat uh, surface, like a flat Earth, shot from height zero. So uh, this vector right here, this is the initial angle you're going to shoot it at. So we think of curves, so if this projectile motion is a curve right here, the initial angle is actually going to be a tangent at time zero right here. So there'll be time zero, t equals zero. So our initial angle will be theta. Now it's a little hard to draw where theta is going to be. So right initial angle will be theta. If I really want to draw it accurately, it would be misleading to draw it from down there because I want to measure from the vector, not from the curve. So I want to measure the angle off the uh, vector, not the curve. So if I really want to draw it accurately, I would need to make sure that I'm explicitly going from the vector to the x-axis. And that is where theta will be as opposed to what you don't want to do is that right there. You're measuring an angle off of a curve. Um, that's not good. Angles between two vectors or two lines. So we'll get a initial position and we'll get initial velocity. And we're going to assume the only force is gravity, and then figure out how do we model this curve right here. So we get to choose the angle and the velocity. So we're going to find r of t, the curve r of t. So that'll be the curve r of t right there. Given initial position, r0 is going to be 0, 0. So we're shooting it from exactly the origin. And initial velocity which of course is the derivative of the position. 
So let's redraw just the velocity vector, the initial velocity vector. Hey, precalculus. So this is a nice precalculus problem right here. And we have theta. So what I need to know is the x and the y component. So if I call the, uh, so, mm -hmm. so let's be x0, y0. I'm using x and y as the, so r of t has two components, an x component, which will be x of t, and a y component, y of t. So that'll be our curve has an x and a y component. And so of course our velocity, our initial velocity will be the x derivative at zero comma y derivative at zero. So any questions on laying out these? So we get to choose our angle, and we get an initial speed. So this is sometimes called muzzle velocity. Why is that a bad term? Well, it's true, but is velocity the right word? No. Because they're assuming no matter what direction you're shooting it, they'll say the velocity is the same. And they'll probably give you a number. Speed? Yeah, it's a speed. But I think that's too entrenched to, is it always called velocity? Well, velocity is a direction and a speed. Yeah, but. Speed is just the magnitude of the set velocity. But then they'll say, ah, it's muzzle velocity is 300 feet per second. So that's a number. So it's definitely not. <laughs> it should be muzzle speed. All right, we'll start a campaign. All right, so we really want to say muzzle speed or initial speed and direction. If you say muzzle velocity, you're really talking about, well, if you're talking to me, you're talking about an actual velocity, not s speed. So we've got an angle. So we're now we need to measure the x and y components of the velocity. So we have a, the vertical side is going to be y, uh, and so this is y prime of 0 is going to be the, I'm going to shortcut a little bit and call it v0. I'm going to use a subscript and write it v with a little subscript 0. I think that'll be better than writing v parentheses 0. Oh, that'll be sine theta, not cosine theta. So that's y prime of 0. And then our x measurement right here, the x component of the velocity vector. x prime 0 is initial speed times cosine theta. V0 is the magnitude V0 cos theta magnitude V0 sine theta. And of course, you can take the scalar out. I wonder how many people don't know what velocity is and only think they do. But a lot of people. So we're going to assume the only force acting is gravity.
So I want to preface all this with the fact that I'm not a physicist. So pretty good at algebra and calculus, but when somebody says F equals MA, I just say OK. So I'm using J here as the vertical component. So J just means the vertical direction. So we're in two dimensions, so I just have an I and a J. So I is going to be horizontal, J is vertical. We got no K component. So we have M times R double prime of T, which is the acceleration at time t, f equals ma. So acceleration is r double prime. So on the right side, acceleration is double, uh, r double prime of t. And on the left side, force is negative, because uh, we want to go down, mass times the uh, acceleration of gravity. Is that, are there any questions on that? Because you have mass on both sides. Of the thing, you oh, they're going to cancel out, yeah. So, now, so why does mass cancel? Well, things fall at the same speed no matter how much they weigh in a vacuum. So a feather falls the same speed as a bowling ball in a vacuum. We don't limit a vacuum, uh, at least not literally. So a feather falls slowly because of there's a whole lot of drag compared to the amount of uh, force that's being pulled down on it. So that's why a feather falls slower. Um, only because of air resistance. But if you put it in a, you know, a tube that has a vacuum, it will fall the same speed that any other object will fall in there. So we're going to cancel mass. Now, the force of gra or the acceleration of gravity is constant, or at least close to constant on Earth. If you go certain places, it's a little different. I think the higher you go, the less it pulls by the smallest amount. You got to get really high. Um, like even on probably Mount Everest, it's probably almost in perceptible. Um, I think it's a little less at the, no, a little less at the equator. It's a little bit. And a little the, the more at the poles. Yeah. yeah so it's a little bit less at the but we make assumptions like it's the same all over. So basically, if you're going to try to hit a t house or a wall with your cannonball, it, you can use the same G. It'll work. So all right. Actually, quick question also. On yeah. The homeworks, uh, we had to use yeah. If you put in 9.81, it gave you a wrong answer. Oh, no. Did it say use 9.8? No, it didn't say 9.8. Oh, no. It's just if you used 9.81, it, it was completely off. Is it, what really likes it. Did you put that in the comments I, on a cam cam canvas? Somebody did. All right, let's write in uh, diamond bracket notation. <laughs> I don't really like IJ notation. So we're only needing two coordinates. So we have 0i, negative g is our second coordinate, or second component. And this is our double prime of t. All right, so now we're starting to form actual vectors here. So we got the acceleration. And what we want to do is find the actual, somewhere, find r of t. So we're going to integrate. And then use our conditions that we know about. And then we're going to integrate a second time and use the other conditions that we know about. So this was like a really easy one to integrate. So that's our double prime of t. So our regular prime of t is the antiderivative of 0 negative g dt. So this integral might be too easy so that it's almost difficult. So remember, you can always write it in IJ notation. You need to write 0i, because otherwise you'll think that you're in um, one dimension. It's 
It's not that there's no x dimension, it's just that there's zero acceleration in the x dimension. There's still an x dimension. There's just no acceleration in that dimension. So the i and the j are really placeholders. So zero i, there's still going to be an i, a constant component that's going to come out in the i direction is why I'm saying that it's important that we keep it. No, that's not t. Antiderivative of 0 is a constant. So I'll call it c1, comma, negative gt plus c2. So any questions on that antiderivative? And we got our constant there. Well, our two constants. Hopefully, I wrote down r prime of 0 somewhere. There we did. So r prime of 0 is what's right below it. Magnitude, initial velocity, cos theta, magnitude, initial velocity, sine theta. So that is r prime of 0. So that's r prime of t. So r prime of 0. Magnitude v0, cos theta, magnitude v0, sine theta, equals c1, comma, negative g, uh, g times 0, plus c2. So I know c1 and c2 are those two numbers that are right there. So C1 is magnitude, initial magnitude times cos theta. C2 is initial magnitude sine theta. So putting this all back together with our original r prime, we have magnitude v0 cos theta, comma, negative g t plus v0 sine theta. So we're going to get r of t by taking an antiderivative another time. And we're going to get some more constants showing up. So I don't want to use c1 and c2, so we'll call them c3 and c4. So we don't reuse the names. So regular r t is antiderivative of r prime of t dt. We're going to need to plug in the condition at the very end, but worry about that when we get there. This is the antiderivative v0 cos theta comma negative gt plus magnitude v0 sine theta dt. So in this antiderivative, there's a lot of letters, but what's the only actual variable as far as the integral is concerned with? t. So there is, yes, there's a theta, and there's a v0. But as far as the integral cares about, it's only t's. So I need to look at just t's. Everything else is just a number up there. So what is the t antiderivative of a number? T. Number times t. So it's just that number, v, magnitude v0 cos theta t right there. So it's that number times t plus a constant. I'm going with c3 here. Now things get a little tricky. What's the antiderivative of t? The t antiderivative of t? t squared over 2. So I'm going to bring down that negative g 
t squared over 2 plus, now here's a constant, antiderivative is constant times t, so b naught sine theta t plus, there could be another constant right there. So any questions on that t antiderivative? And we assume that our initial position was 0, 0. So we shot the projectile from the origin. So our 0 is 0, 0. So I'm going to plug in 0 wherever I see t, not wherever I see theta. So make sure this is t is 0. Theta, who knows? Uh, you know, you could shoot it with uh, theta 0, but that's not what we're saying right here. So our time, our t, is 0. So we're going to get. First term 0 plus c3, comma 0 plus 0 plus c4. So right away we can see that c3 is 0, c4 is also 0. And we're ready to write our ideal projectile motion. Magnitude v0, cos theta cos theta t comma negative g t squared over 2 plus v naught sine theta t and just rewriting what our theta and uh, v naught so this is what initial angle theta v naught is initial magnitude v naught initial speed I'll write muzzle velocity but I don't want to make an angry face and initial position This is called ideal projectile motion. So that negative g over 2 t squared, that's where our parabola becomes sad. That's the sad parabola part right there. All right. You've probably played Angry Birds or seen somebody play it. That's proje ideal projectile motion. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's... And what? At its finest, yes, absolutely. All right, so I'll just write down this problem in the book, and you can go and solve it. I'll just write IPM um, equation when speed v naught is five hundred m's per s, meters per second, angle 60 degrees. Um, so where will it land 60, se where will it be 10 seconds later? Uh, what is max height? and total flight time. And what is the range at this angle? 
Max range is a little more tricky. You have to pick your theta to hit your max range. But at this theta, what is the range? All right, so these are all questions that I'm pretty sure will be on a homework also. So one of them, I think the max height, you actually have to take a derivative and figure out what is the maximum your y of t function will have. And so take a derivative, set equal to 0, and then plug that t value back in. And that will give you the height. Uh, because you know ideal projectile motion, you can use some geometry if you really want. But I discourage it. The max height will happen halfway bef between takeoff and landing in ideal projectile motion. But don't use that fact to find the maximum. Because if it's not ideal, obviously it won't be happening. So take derivatives, set it equal to 0 to find max. Or min.